Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I am Howard Hayden here. And Howard, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I was born here in Pueblo, Colorado at a very tender age. I graduated from Aurora High School, went to the University of Denver, where I got a BS, MS, and PhD, all in physics. And then I went to the University of Connecticut, where I spent 32 years with occasional forays down to Oak Ridge. And then I retired to come back to Pueblo in 1999, and here I am. I became interested in energy way back in grad school, and I found that there were some, well, somebody had asked me a question about wind turbines, and so I looked them up in something like Mark's Mechanical Engineering Handbook or something like that, and they were talking about wind output in units of horsepower hours. And eventually, I wrote a paper which was published in the American Journal of Physics, as I recall, called Rosetta Stones for Energy Problems. And the whole idea there was that people who are, in one way or another, concerned with energy have a heck of a time talking to one another because they all use different units. The whole idea was to convert everybody to use Sistem Internacional, International yeah. System Units. The unit of energy is the joule. The unit of, of power is the watt. A watt is a joule per second and so forth. Yeah. And to get rid of this garbage like Langley's for calories per square centimeter per day and junk like that and do it all in one system of units. And along the way, I became interested in various energy, nuclear and coal and oil and all that kind of stuff. And now I find that a whole lot of energy is being suppressed under the perhaps well-meaning guise of, of global warming. Well, that's what they did call it. Now they call it climate change because that covers everything like warming, cooling, more floods, less floods, more rain, less rain, more desert, less desert. Anyway, that's my background. So anyone who's watching your show a lot really ought to have a little bit of fun. So I'm going to tell them how to make a quick buck. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a quick buck artist, but anyway, this is going to be fun. Now, the whole idea here is you have to know somebody who is a climate guru. That is somebody who is one of these people that is a strong believer in the climate crisis and all that sort of stuff. And so I'm going to explain how, how to make a quick buck off these people by making a big bet. Oh, yeah, a thousand bucks. Okay, the first thing is, you know, the IPCC makes heat balance charts. At least they did. They did not do one in the first assessment report, which was written in 1990, but they have ever since. These heat balance charts basically uh, on the left-hand side so show sunlight coming in and some reflected and some absorbed. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle, you got some processes like evaporation and heat contact where the wind cools down the earth and heats the atmosphere. And over at the right, you have a bunch of radiation going out. And way over at the far right, you have some radiation that is sent from the clouds and the greenhouse gases and so forth back to the Earth. You might notice that there are a bunch of numbers in there. All of those numbers are expressed in watts per square meter, averaged over the surface of the Earth. If you look carefully, you might notice that some numbers are a little bit different. For example, in the upper left, you see incoming sunlight at 342 and down at the lower right is 340. Now up in the upper left, you have 235 watts showing long wave radiation and down the lower right, it's 239. If you look, say, down at the lower right, actually the lower two are very similar, but you'll look at numbers like the incoming sunlight, they say, 340, but it's 340 comma 341. In other words, give or take about a half a watt per square meter. 
And the reflected amount is 100, which is the high side of 97 to 100 and so forth. So, so those numbers are generally not exactly known, okay? But they're known pretty well. And the people who make up these heat balance charts go out of their way to make sure that things that ought to balance do indeed balance. And I'll show you here. But first, we'll all get to something else. So we've got these five heat balance things done from 1995 to the latest one in 2021. And what about the heat balance charts for the future? That's where a big rub comes in. And I'm going to show you the heat balance drawings for the future, the complete set. Zero. They have not done a single one. So you might be seeing where you can make a buck. Challenge your climate guru to make a heat balance chart for the future. Let's have a look. Now, this is one of the heat balance drawings. In fact, I think this one is the most recent. But up at the top, you see uh, sunlight absorbed equals the infrared leaving the Earth. There's is this called the planetary heat balance equation? That uh, this is true for every planet, everything that orbits the sun. It absorbs sunlight and radiates away heat. And if those two are not equal, you're in disequilibrium. But given the long time that things have been going on, those two are always equal. Although we have, you know, things can vary on short term, but on long term, they cannot. So, for example, you'll notice on the left there, we have 340 watts per square meter, give or take a little bit incoming, 100 watts per square meter, give or take going out. So we're absorbing 240. And then way down at the lower left, you'll see we have an imbalance of 0 0.6 approximately watts per square meter. And outgoing, we have 239. Well, those things are pretty darn close to being exactly equal. But th there are some other equalities. For example, if we have 240 absorbed there, that's equal to the sum of the 79 over at the left that's absorbed by the atmosphere and the 161 that is absorbed by the surface. Okay? So... <clears throat> Now we have a total of three more heat balance equations. Sunlight to the earth is equal to absorbed sunlight plus reflected sunlight. Heat into the air equals the heat leaving the air. Heat into the surface equals the heat leaving the surface. So you see we have numerous uh, equations that are, that are balanced. The numbers are balanced because people have gone out of their way to Fudge this one, you know, what's the most likely value of this and the most likely value of that in such a way that it leaves all of those things in balance. But now let me explain a little bit of something. Suppose you decided you want to find out how tall Tom Nelson is. So you set up an experiment to measure the distance. Well, we'll stand him on the stand him on the equator on the on the equinoxes. And so you measure the distance between your feet and the sun and the distance between the head and the sun and subtract. You know, you might find out that you are negative 878 meters tall, but that's what you get when you try to obtain a small difference by subtracting large numbers that are all uh, somewhat variable. So... These numbers that you see, you can't measure them directly like we can measure your height directly. So those numbers, like where you're trying to get the balance, that's really hard to do. And so there is some uncertainty in there, and just don't get too excited about it. But just don't believe anything that's high, highly precise. We're almost there. Where does this number come from, that 398 watts per square meter? It's called a thermal upsurface. I call that the surface emission. Where does that number come from? It's calculable from the surface temperature by 
an equation called the Stefan Boltzmann equation, which I will discuss later. Anyway, that tells us that the temperature that produces that 398 watts per square meter is 289.45 Kelvin, which is the same as 16.3 Celsius. Again, the, the, you notice that 398 is give or take, well, they say between 394 and 400. So that number of 289.45 is also plus or minus, you know, about a degree or plus or minus a half a degree, something like that. Okay, you can always find the Stefan Boltzmann radiation law on the internet. As I said, I'll discuss it later, but if you don't get that, look it up on the internet. And do not get yourself wrapped around the axle about pretentious precision, because it's just nuts. Okay, there's more. All those five charts are missing a very important number. You may notice a kind of a vacancy in there. Why is this region blank? You got this arrow pointing up to the clouds and so forth. And what's missing? That is where the greenhouse effect comes in. Now for the missing number. If you were to ask the ordinary mortal, what does the IPC specialize in? They would tell you the greenhouse effect. So what number is missing from their heat balance charts? The greenhouse effect. This is a little bit hard to find. Believe it or not, the first, the very, very first direct explicit mention of Stefan Boltzmann occurs in the sixth assessment report, which is in 2021. And they've been writing about the, the global warming and stuff since 1990. So there's 31 years in there when they have failed to mention the Stefan Boltzmann equation. In any case, there's a very opaque paragraph, and I have given the indication there. It's in chapter seven, and the paragraph number is 7.4.2.1 Planck response. And it refers to the greenhouse effect G, and then it says G equals 159 watts per square meter. That is, after a mere 31 years, the IPC has assigned both the symbol and a number to the greenhouse effect. And it's nothing more, nothing less than the difference between the surface radiation and the radiation to space. It's 159. Take a look here. The equation over at the right, G is equal to this minus that. 398 minus 239 is 159. That's the greenhouse effect. That's missing from every single one of their heat balance drawings. Now we get to the climate weight, to the wagers. You challenge your climate guru. And here's a 10,000 wager if you can find some real suckers. They say, I'll bet you 10,000 bucks you can't find even one heat balance drawing in any assessment report made for any year past 2021. There is no such chart. And it's hard to believe that any anyone having anything to do with the IPCC would be stupid enough to take you up on the bet. So, I mean, I don't think you're going to make money that way. But here's a $1,000 wager that you might get somebody to take you up on. Guru, pick a model, any model. Pick a time, any time, let's say not tomorrow, but 20 years into the future, 50 years, something like that. And you pick a model. Now, over here at the left is a drawing made somewhat legible by putting in large lettering on the, on the scales there, showing how much carbon dioxide they expect the world to be releasing into the atmosphere versus time. And they call these various socioeconomic pathways. Over on the right, and this is actually from older work, but it shows a bunch of models showing the basically the heavy lines in there are the kind of expectations corresponding to 
various uh, emission scenarios. And all these individual lines with individual wiggles are various models where they assume various coefficients, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and so forth. So pick, say, some point like that. Sometime in the future, how much CO2 is going to be in the air and then so forth. And then what you got to do is take that particular model, take the numerical results from it, and make a heat balance diagram. You can look to see if there's a one in the drawing. You have a couple of weeks to look. Or you can use the numbers that are produced by your chosen models and make your own heat balance chart. But your chart must satisfy all of those five energy balance equations. Good luck with that. Now, let me tell you why these are safe bets. In the first place, you're probably not going to find those drawings. But the IPC has experts who have their own political bosses, by the way, because nothing that they write in their reports can contradict what is written first in the summary for policymakers. But in any case, you have a group that makes up the heat balance and other people make predictions about the future based on what they think wind patterns are going to be and this and that, and they don't really talk to one another. Now I'll show you why. We're going to talk about what's called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. The IPC calls that ECS is the, the abbreviation for it. But it is a temperature rise due to CO2 doubling at equilibrium. That is, what happens if CO2 doubles? Right now, you're probably asking yourself, what's the big deal about doubling? Well, there's a formula saying that radiative forcing due to CO2 goes like a logarithm of the CO2 concentration. So if you just say the concentration has doubled, then you have the logarithm of 2, and natural log is 0 0.69315, who cares? Anyway, so that's why they deal with the doubling. I mean, it's just a mathematical reason, and it's perfectly arbitrary. The IPC says that the most probable value of the ECS, in other words, the most likely temperature rise due to doubling CO2, is 3 degrees. If the temperature does rise by 3 degrees, the increase in the surface emission, that bottom figure they had of 398, it has to increase by 16.7 watts per square meter. And the IPC says, well, the most probable may be three, but the very likely range is two to five. So what's the increase in surface for those? Basically, that's between 11 and 28 watts per square meter in surface emission. Now, the IPCC also says, if the CO2 doubles, the increase in the greenhouse effect due to doubling is 3.7 watts per square meter. Now, how can 3.7 watts per square meter of increased ability to hold back radiation hold back somewhere between 11 and 28 watts per square meter? He said the surface emission, it just didn't even happen. This is CO2 doubling. According to the IPCC, the emission to outer space remains constant because you still have sunlight coming in. You still have about 30% of it being reflected. So the increased blocking of IR is 3.7 watts per square meter. The increase in surface radiation is 16 point watts per square meter if the temperature increases by 3 degrees. That's a physical impossibility. It can't happen. What do you mean by equilibrium? Equilibrium is a lot of things to a lot of people, but in any case, most of the time we're dealing with slight variations. We're dealing with a certain amount of disequilibrium. Well, let's say we go back to one of those models where they say, okay, the CO2 is going to rise at a certain rate. Well, there's a little time delay, and so things haven't really quite reached equilibrium in, say, 2050, but they're going to be bad and they're going to get worse. Just wait. So I'm going to show you another graph, and I'm quite sure that you'll have a dickens of a time trying to read this graph, but don't worry because I'm going to show you more about it 
in just a minute here. This graph, as I said before, is the e emissions in of CO2 versus time using various models about how governments might co coerce people to use less fossil fuel and so forth. And down at the bottom, we have five charts in there, uh, all of them labeled SSP something or another. SSP is a shared socioeconomic pathway, followed by an X dash, followed by another number, and then the other number is called the radiating forcing. And the X refers to numbers that might be in those graphs up above. They're just, in other words, they have to do with how much CO2 the people expect to be emitting. And the consequences, these are in degree C. Of the left bar is the total consequence in degree C. The bar next to it is the amount that's due to CO2. The amount that's next to that is due to other greenhouse gases, water vapor, this and the other thing. And the other one has to do with albedo. And albedo is the reflectivity of the Earth as a whole. In other words, we reflect about 30% of sunlight into the air. And you might notice that all of the changes that are due to albedo are negative changes. In other words, they are assuming that for some reason or another, the Earth is becoming a little bit more reflective and letting less sunlight in. Now we'll get around to these numbers. We're going to be discussing that radiative forcing. These are the numbers, SSP 1-1.9, 1-2.6, and so forth. And what those numbers to the right of the dash mean is the radiative forcing due to all causes. And by all causes, I mean I mean the following. There, some of the radiative forcing is due to changes in the amount of CO2. You notice that they have, that was the big effect. And you have changes in amounts of other greenhouse gases, water vapor, methane, N2O, ozone. Another possibility is a change in the sunlight reaching the orbit, but they don't predict any change in the orbit. The fourth thing is a change in the reflectivity of the planet. So they have put together all forcings together. Here is a larger view so you can see exactly what's going on. SSP day 3-7.0. That's the fourth one over, not the fifth. But it doesn't make any difference. They're, they all have the same problem. Model 3, total radiative forcing. These are forcings with respect to 1850. In other words, down here, you see a temperature rise of a little bit less than one degree since 1850. And that's the, temp the temperature rise due to that time. And the forcing now for the whole graph in here refers to the forcing that will exist by the range of 2080 to 2100. And it's in temperature, it's up there around a 3.5 seven or so degrees. And you can see that the lion's share of that is due to carbon dioxide, non-CO2 greenhouse gases, water vapor and methane and so forth are less than half of what the uh, CO2 effect is. And aerosols they have going down. Now we're going to take a closer look. What I'm doing is here on the left, I'm adding in the increase in the surface IR in watts per square meter calculated from the Stefan Boltzmann equation. You'll notice that by 2080, the temperature rise of about 3.7 degrees Celsius would result in about 20 watts per square meter. Okay, seven watts per square meter. There's that new temperature, so that new surface emission scale. And that chart very specifically says that the increased ability to stop IR due to changes in CO2 and all other G greenhouse gases and changes in albedo due to land usages and aerosol is 7 watts per square meter. Somehow that's supposed to block 20 watts per square meter from going into space. I have a bridge for sale. Now, what are the meaning? What's the meaning of the bizarre results? 
If the surface radiation exceeds the greenhouse effect, then the radiation to space increases. As you, you're producing more at the surface than you can stop, okay? When the radiation to space exceeds the heat absorbed from the sun, the Earth is in a cooling period. It has to be. So how can a minor increase in the greenhouse effect cause the surface temperature to rise so much that it has to be cooling rapidly? Only the IPCC knows for sure. If anybody is still paying attention here, hmm. the IPCC does not apply the Stefan Boltzmann law to their results. They make up these models. They predict a future temperature. They do not take a look at that temperature and say, how much more will the surface radiate? Therefore, they cannot construct heat balance charts for any of their scenarios. You must do so. And here is the Stefan Boltzmann equation. I equals 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter, Kelvin to the fourth, times the temperature raised to the fourth power. And of course, that temperature means the temperature in Kelvin. 273.16, I think, plus the temperature in Celsius. You apply it to a current temperature, and just for GPs, see if you can test yourself. Take that temperature of 289.45K and get the result of 398 watts per square meter. Now, for those of you who are not really acquainted with using five using scientific notation some ca some scientific calculators allow you to do this kind of calculation more or less directly i would say that probably most of you would find it uh, easier to use excel a spreadsheet and for 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 you use 5.67 e minus 8 and Excel knows what you mean. And for the temperature raised to the fourth power, use 289.45 carat four. Or you can use 289.45 times 289.45 times 289. That gets a little bit silly, but you can do it either way. Anyway, that's how you get it, and that's how you use it. And... Scientific calculators allow you to do this actually very easily. Now apply it to some other temperature, like three degrees warmer, and then you find out how much more you find out what the new surface emission would be, and then you subtract. And you understand exactly what, how the world has been conned. Remember, they do not apply this equation to their results. All they have to do is try it, and all of a sudden, you find out they've been conning themselves. Here's some take-home principles. Planetary heat balance. At equilibrium, the heat radiated to space equals, well, let me lift off an S there, sorry, the heat absorbed, solar heat absorbed. The heat radiated to space equals the heat radiated from the surface minus the greenhouse effect. So I out equals I surface minus G, which means you absorb sunlight equals I surface minus G. Very simple equations, and you know how to put the numbers in. There you have it. And the radiative forcing from greenhouse gases simply adds to the greenhouse effect. Now, let me explain what I think has been a fetish with not only the IPCC, but climate scientists in general, they have regarded the radiation to space as a percentage of the radiation emitted by the surface. That's about 60%, but they make a big deal of that percentage. But it's, I mean, it's true. There's nothing wrong with calculating it, but it is a number that has no physical significance. Whereas the greenhouse effect does have physical significance. It is the amount, the net amount of IR that is absorbed by the atmosphere, and the radiative forcing from greenhouse gases simply adds to it. Energy is an additive quantity, not a multiplicative quantity. In other words, their fetish 
their obsession with the multiplying factor has gotten them, say, confused. You can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time, and that's enough to set up a multi-billion dollar climate crisis industry. Have you had the chance to debate this with any IPCC people to uh, to see what is their excuse for forgetting to do this and doing that sanity check? No, I really don't know any IPCC people. There are some people that I have sent some emails to from time to time, sort of expressing that last equation, and I've gotten instant nothing. Okay. And protracted nothing. <laughs> no response whatsoever. <clears throat> uh, so what do you think is the correct answer then? If you do this right and you double CO2 and leave everything else exactly the same, what temperature do we get in uh, 2100? Well, in, in 2100, I don't know because I don't know. What the, well, but with the forcing of 0 0.7, uh, I mean, with 7 watts per square meter, if I take that particular figure, this would be a temperature rise of... Maybe one point, yeah, no. well, I don't know. Well, maybe even something like 0. 0.9 degrees C, but it, it isn't it isn't terribly much. The temperature due to doubling, you know, whenever that doubling might occur, and it depends on the model. That if you assume that the warming is due entirely to CO2, you come up with about 0. 0.6 degrees Celsius as the temperature change. And if you throw in the water vapor and stuff that they put in, it's going to be a little bit higher, 0 0.75 or something like that. Anyway, it's nothing to write home about. Okay. Do you think there's much of a lag? Because some people are saying, oh, there's so much heat baked into the system and we just haven't seen it yet. Or if we were to double CO2 instantly somehow in one day, how long would it take for everything to like settle out? Oh, yeah. it's, it's hard to say because in terms of carbon that goes into the atmosphere and carbon that goes out of the atmosphere on an annual basis, and it's in gigatons of only the carbon only. I mean, they keep track of carbon, not carbon dioxide, for decent reasons. There's something like 200 units that goes into the atmosphere and 200 that comes out of the atmosphere every year. And all of humanity's burning of fossil fuels is responsible for about eight. So, but what that means is that, oh, and another thing is that the total atmospheric concentration, I, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but I think it's about equal to five, I don't think it's as large as 10, of that, I have 200 going into the, into the atmosphere, and it's less than 2,000, so that the total CO2 quantity is exchanged in a matter of something like five to 10 years. So it's hard to say. Okay. All right. Do you have other thoughts on what else the IPCC is getting wrong other than this? Or do you think they understand the carbon cycle? Do you think they understand solar effects and volcanoes and any other opinions? Well, <clears throat> well the big volcanic thing, of course, was the eruption of Tamboro in 1815, which caused to put so much sulfate and stuff into the atmosphere that we had 1816 was the year without a summer. So yeah, they know a little bit about that, but are you going to predict when the next big volcano is going to erupt? No, you just don't know that. One thing of course is happening is that the CO2 is, is plant food and it's causing evidently a greening of the earth. I hear these people talking about the melting of the glaciers. Well, if you would go back to, let's take the beginning of the Jewish calendar, which is something like over 5,000 years ago. I don't know what the number was. Those glaciers did not exist. They weren't there. The earth was warmer then. And yeah. so, you know, at, at 5,000 years ago, all that's well within, you know, the human civilization. Another thing is a very interesting thing. In one of the pyramids, they have found a kind of a neat, let's just call it a painting and drawing or something on the wall. And it's showing a picture of what looks like the African veldt. In other words, now where, is, where are the pyramids? They're in the Egyptian desert, right? Why would they be painting a picture of something that looks like trees and grass and animals? Well, because it was warmer and wetter back in those days. 
And in other words, the Sahara is a result of the drying over the last several thousand years. So there you have it. Another thing, by the way, that you can raise with a guru is this. I don't think any climate scientists on the planet would regard Al Gore as an expert, but Al Gore's signature achievement, perhaps, is the video where he's walking across the screen showing that the CO2 and the temperature are going up and down together more or less synchronously. And he is implying, of course, that the CO2 is causing the temperature to rise and fall, right? Yes. So ask the question, Mr. Gore, I missed something. Could you tell me where the CO2 came from that caused the earth to warm up? And could you tell me where the CO2 went if it caused the earth to cool down? Why does the CO2 go down after the earth has cooled? Just like your drawings show? I mean, th those questions are totally obvious and uh, totally ignored by all those climate people. But as again, I don't think any climate scientist on the planet would regard him as as a scientist. Very good point. I think my last question here is, what do you think would be the best uh, global average temperature for life on Earth and the best CO2 level for life on Earth? What's optimum? Oh, heck, I don't know. But it looks as if we we could use a lot more CO2. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we came dangerously close to getting to the point during the last glacial maximum, we got very, we got dangerously close to the level where plant life couldn't survive. And I wouldn't see anything wrong with having twice as much CO2 as we presently have. The earth has survived when we had 10 times as much as we presently have. And I don't know what the best, best possible temperature is. Now, I'm living here in Pueblo, Colorado. When I was a kid, my brother and I went to school once when it was 28 below, we walked to school. A few years later, we were in a different place, a little farther from school, and we did not go to school when it was 32 below, or at least that's what the guy on the radio said, but the official temperature is 31 below. Anyway, and the highest temperature that I've seen since I moved back was 109. Those are all in Fahrenheit, of course. So you know, now you know to where. And you know, I just can't see that a one degree temperature change is going to make any terribly big deal. And warmer is probably better because the cold turns out to be far worse for people. And if the earth warms up, we have much better growing conditions in the, in the Arctic regions and so forth. So, Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. I think one degree centigrade of cooling from here would actually be a pretty bad thing for agriculture. I don't think that would be helpful. Well, well yes, it yeah. would. In fact, you're talking about conditions a little bit more than that, and you're talking about the Little Ice Age, mm -hmm. which, of course, has been denied by people of the hockey stick persuasion. <laughs> so, so any other points you'd like to make before we go ahead and wrap up? No, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to your audience, and I... I should point out, uh, if anybody's recorded this or they can get a hold of you, if you uh, need to contact me about anything, my email is on that um, the bottom there on every one of the screens I showed. So, Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. And we'll talk to you next time. Howard Hayden. Thank you. Okay, Tom. Right, Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. All right. Goodbye. Bye.